Hey everybody, welcome to another live Q&A with Dan Earlywine. I'm Brock Poling, your host. Um, I run the marketing team here at Stumac, and I've been a guitar maker for more than 20 years. And we are really glad you're here with us today. Um, we have had an enormous amount of response and questions that have come in from you guys all over our social media. They've come in from YouTube. They've come in from Instagram. They've come in from Facebook. Um, you know, they're still coming in. We've got questions coming in now. So we're going to take about the next 90 minutes and we're going to go through your questions. So uh, some of them are kind of spillover from last time. Some of them came in from social media. Again, we'd love to get more questions from you now. So that'd be great. And we got the whole gang here. We got Susan and Rachel on the cameras. Um, Ali's man in the comments. We've got Dan, of course, who's going to be, you know, the man of the hour and answering all your questions. Ready to go. So, yeah. So, Bring them out. so there you go. Yeah. Very exciting. So hit me. All right. So, hey, Dan, we've already got some questions that are um, coming in from the viewers, but um, let's take one right off the top. That's from the from the comments that are sitting here. And that is, um, boy, wow, they're really coming in. Um, OK, so, Dan, we've got a guy who has built his own guitar. He's put a sparkle finish on it and the nitro is is checking and crazing on it. What should he do? Well, you'd have to think about what's making it do that. You know, you is it the uh, temperature, hot or cold, or is it moisture or too dry? How long has it been drying? How many coats are on it? How thick is it? Sometimes if you spray a really thick coat, it, it can crack. Um, something isn't right. My question would be, is it an aerosol can, or are you putting it into a spray gun and mixing your own? Mm-hmm. Are you thinning it too thick or thin? There's all those questions that spraying a, a finish that doesn't do that. Do you have a suggestion of what he might do to get the genie back in the bottle? You can try to. Uh, I would take some, uh, I use a chemical called butylcellosol that I can mix with my lacquer and my thinner. It's pretty hot. It's a hot, got a lot of, toluene or whatever it is, and it's a hot lacquer that can melt stuff together, and that's what Blush Eraser is, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And if he's and if he's using aerosols, could he do that through like a spray valve or yeah, a pre-valve? You could do that. I would try it with an aerosol. That stuff's pretty strong. You, I would do it outdoors. Uh huh. You know, and uh, it's gonna if it you'd spray it like it was a coat. You know, if it started to run, mm -hmm. and sometimes it can get into that top coat and melt it together. Okay. If, I don't know what kind of lacquer it is. I don't know. I, I presume. So that's a basic answer. Okay. It All can right. be fixed. And I'd try to fix it before going back down to the wood. Okay. Sounds great. Okay, Dan, we've got a question from Giovanni, which this came in um, from the YouTube community. And he says, hello, sir. I have a nice 60s style Strat whose neck won't counterbalance to the string tension anymore. The truss rod is maxed out. I tried lighter nine gauge strings versus my normal 10 gauges, yet the bow is still pretty pronounced. In the summer months when it's hot, the problem gets even worse and it makes the guitar unplayable. What would you suggest? For some reason, I'm thinking that your bow is going backwards. I think it's going up. Is, or is it going up, an up bow? Yeah, because he's- And he the put... truss rod is maxed out? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know the brand of it. There's a lot of different kind of truss rods. Uh, it's a Strat style guitar, right? Mm -hmm, that's what he says. But not necessarily a Fender. Yeah, I, I presume it's not a Fender based on the so way you worded I would, the question. Um, I'd wonder if I could get some more purchase on the rod by if the nut comes off, like down at this end. This guitar doesn't. This guitar just at that end. Mm -hmm. But at the easy end, I would take the nut off and see how much if you put a little shim in there to take up some of that slop, if you could straighten that out. Of course, when I adjust the neck, I will um, almost always loosen the truss rod completely. And I use something like this, which I brought in the other day because we were using it. I used to use my dad's level. I, I've got two little blocks that can space over the strings and I will clamp that into a back bow with the truss rod loose. 
Okay. Yep. That's what this is uh, so good for. Uh huh. And then tighten the truss rod. And you go as far as you got what it takes to uh, not break it. And uh, you, you probably won't. You could break an old Harmony rod. Some of those break pretty easy. You think you're going to get, because they don't even work that good, that well. Okay. And uh, if you have a spacer on that, you might get a new purchase on it, just because you backboat it. I mean, it's amazing how many times this solves that problem on Gibsons and every import. Okay. So that'd be your first. That'd be your Just first. Just connect with it. Loose, not loose. Clamp it into a bit of a back bow. If you can't have somebody hold it, mm -hmm. you hold that. I can pull this down and adjust it at the same time. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Dirk. And Dirk says Hi, Dan. Greetings from Germany. Can you please offer advice about fender neck angle and neck pocket adjustments, particularly how to shave it? I think the perfect nut, nut angle is important. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think the perfect neck angle is important for perfect action and preventing the guitar from fretting out on seven and a quarter inch necks. But I'm having, but I'm not having much luck finding information on how to dial it in perfectly. My Clapton Strat is perfect, but my Robert Cray needs help. Thank you, and all the best to the States. Well, that's a lot. It is a lot. Are we saying that um, clap the strat that... So I think, yeah, so for the first part of the question is, can you please offer advice about fender neck angle and neck pocket he adjustments? He said shaving. Yeah, he said shaving, particularly wanna, how to shave it. You're not going to shave anything off. Right. You And I looked at that one yep. yesterday. One thing I'll do in the studio is mess it up. You know that. That's what they hire right, of me course, for. right? Yeah. Murphy's Law prevails. There's no other way. That's a simple thing. Of, to me, if you want to change the neck angle, you can shim it. And making these shims is really hard. What are you doing with those shims, Dan? These are... There's a one they degree. Have, they got some... Uh, on one side, some, some numbers on Yep. So you know what, there's one degree, half a degree, quarter of a degree, and there's no holes in them. So if you had a neck that didn't have a standard four bolt location, like a three bolt, or other brands that are different, you can make it. They also come, I'm not trying to do a sales job here, I'm getting into one though. Well, I mean, if you made a couple these, of those, you realize you how, these, how convenient those are. You, you can't make a perfect one until you're really, really, really good. And even then, once you get a milling machine or some, you'll do it on a machine. And I'm not sure. These must be, I don't know how they make these. It's, I don't know. I, all I know is it's perfectly thick here and nothing there, and it's tapered. Yeah. That's what you want for that. These are also killer for shimming fingerboards on neck resets. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes perfect, and it can stain it. I can stain it black mm -hmm. and put it on an ebony board, just mm -hmm. the amount that I need. But that's what you want for that. As far as the, the radius of the board and the choking out on it, I'd think that would be in the fret dressing, the fret leveling. It's probably not leveled perfectly. Also, seven and a quarter inch radius is on a real strat. You can note out a lot on those if they're not broken in and you don't have the saw for it. That's why Fender... In my opinion, went to a nine and a half and a ten. Just a lot of people wanted a flatter radius because it bends easier. Yep. Okay, yeah. I'm going to call an audible on you. I'm going to take one from the uh, from the audience here. This comes in from Oscillation Overdrive, and um, David Evans jumps in right behind it, and he basically says that he'd like to hear the answer to this too. Okay. It says, will I be able to get a great nitro finish from spray cans, or is it better to go to someone who can paint with a spray gun. I'm hearing um, even accelerant cans won't dry as hard as with a gun. You mean the, you want to do it yourself? I think this question is, can he, get a, can he get a professional quality finish from aerosol cans? With him doing it or a professional doing him it? Him doing it, or should he just go find somebody who can spray it 
you know, just do if contract what, If you really want a professional job, and this is one of your first 10 jobs, um, and you don't want to go through a lot of cans, I'd take it to a pro and pay for it. If you were lucky, if you were nice, and you might let them, you might let you come in and watch them a bit. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a, that's how I got in and learned that stuff. Yeah, mine was an auto body guy. I went to the head of the Ferris State Auto Body Department, Joe Badowski, and he taught me how to paint. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can get a get a pro quality finish off an, off a can? I've seen them. Yep, I think so. It takes a long time to dry, much longer, I would say. Uh -huh. um, but I don't think the average do-it-yourselfer is going to get it without a lot of practice. Okay. Well, I will also say this. I've just a, seen some, and uh, that people did. I was pretty impressed. Yeah. I will say this. There's a lot of custom builders out there. You know, I mean, a lot of those guys are still doing contract finishing. So they're, you know, that's that in and of itself is an, is an art. That never used to exist. Right. That yeah, you, that's all brand new. That you can send your guitar out to a guy that really does it and mm -hmm. go about doing something else if you're in the business. I'm doing that now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I've got two guitars out being sprayed. Yeah. Because I don't want to spray whole finishes on guitars. I know guys that do it better. Well, you know what they say. Building the guitar is 90% of the work. And That's finishing, right. it's the other 90%. I'm no expert, but I know experts. And <laughs> i got a couple of them that can do it. Yeah. All right. Okay, Dan. Got a question coming in from Steve Dowler. This is coming in from YouTube. It says, hi, Dan. Great idea for a live Q&A. My question is, yeah. how do I reduce the size of a bridge pin hole so a set okay. of standard width and taper pins fit snugly? I have a Martin 518 from 1954, and I don't want to replace the bridge. I read this one, too. Yeah. Um, so I'm ready for that. You, I mean, what I would do is we have now at Stu Mac, we have wooden bridge pin pluggers. They're five degree wooden ebony or rosewood plugs that can plug a lot of holes. Can you hold that up for a second? Like maybe yeah, you, you could come, if you wanted to come in here a bit, I'm, I've got it over on this vice. Oh, yeah, I see. I was going to see if you could see that. See, what I did was took one of those and reamed the hole with a five-degree reamer, right? Until it fit tight at the bottom because that's a straight-through hole that's drilled at the factory. That's a nominal size. You have to reach all the way to the bottom with your reamer to get that fit. So it's poking out enough. It's tight on the bottom. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. And I can just go in here, wedge it in there tight, and cut it off. I don't know if I'd use this saw at home, but I can do it. Now, if you were doing this on a guitar, you'd have to cut off some of that tip of that before you even poked it in because you'd hit the bridge pad. Mm -hmm. But with that, with a little measuring, you could take your calipers and measure down right th through there. You think you could fit them in there? I could fit something in there mm -hmm. and know the depth. Now I'd be cutting it off here, gluing it in with, I'd probably use epoxy, 24-hour cure, mm -hmm. uh, West System, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 106 or Hardener. Yeah. G-Flex. I learned about that from Ian Davlin. And you cut that off, and the beauty of this is it has a small hole right through the center of it. So you're already centered with your drill bit. And you can dr drill that, that out with a small drill, ream it, and fit new pins. I've never used these, but I've done this kind of job my own way. Not as easy as this. The one thing I would say, because I use these for fingerboard plugs too. If you drill a hole, mm -hmm. you steam a neck out, or mm -hmm. other wood plugs for various reasons, yep. you plug them with a, a wood dowel. And I cut those out of a solid piece of wood going this way with something like
Who's been messing this place up? I think you have, haven't you? <laughs> I did have it around. It was a little hole saw. Oh, uh, okay. Remember that? So you can cut a plug uh -huh. if you have the right size hole saw and plug it with a solid piece down that hole. And that, you don't even have to taper it for that. Uh -huh. But this is very clever. And by the time you ream it back out, there's almost no wood left. It's like bushing a violin peg, uh -huh. in a sense. Okay. Very cool. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to take a couple more here from the uh, from the questions that have come in. If I get trailing off, just tell me. No, you're good, Dan. I mean, that's what people want. They want the answers to these questions. Sometimes they go beyond. All right, Dan, I've got a guy um, here. His name, uh, J Ram. And he says, I have a roller bridge on my guitar, but it rattles a lot. Um, and I think it's the loose screws. What can I do? And is there a product I can buy, I can apply to it? What's the brand? Doesn't say. What kind of bridge is it? A roller bridge. Well, it's, there's so many different types. Well, so, so let me say it this way. Let's say a roller bridge comes in and is rattling. What do, you, what do you start to look at? How do you start to troubleshoot it? Every point that moves. Okay. The roller on the, the pins. Yeah. If it's rattling, something's loose. Something, and almost always you can fix something like that. You think it's, you, most of the time you think it's a screw? Could be. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hazard a guess because you could go through all that and never find it and then find it. You've tightened your strap button that was gone. Okay. All right. So uh, David Munoz, um, he's put this question in a couple of times I saw it go by. It says, no offense, he said, but I've heard so many bad things about electric guitar kits, and I'm a bit skeptical, but I need, um, I need a go-to guitar because mine needs new frets. Will yours be it? Um, I, I just need a little push. You have a guitar that you don't like? I want I think, to get a different I, guitar. Yeah, I think, he, I think he's looking for a different guitar. Different guitar. And you want to make it. It's a kit, right? I think he's asking, is, 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 is can a kit be a good guitar? Yes, it's up to the person putting it together, and uh, th there's various grades of kits, you know. Yep. You're asking me that, and this isn't a plant, but Susan put this guitar on the bench, and for a reason now, I see. But that was called in, wasn't it? It, it literally just came in yeah. now. Um, this so, is a kit. Once again, here I am selling something. That's not what I'm supposed to do, but it's true because I was just – Loving this thing when I we're setting up. This is one that Trev Wilkinson's making. And he's a great builder. And I have a Trev guitar that I bought at an AM show seven years ago that I love. It's just amazing. This is a kit. So if you wanna if you were to put this together, but it's not inexpensive, you have it's like it's like any great factory said, here's a one of our guitars. If you put it together and Fit the nut and all that, I'll sell it to you for blah, blah, blah. It's killer. So, yes, you can. Yeah, that's that's definitely the case. I was just over there looking. I was looking for one of our um, other kits. I think they're upstairs. The, um, the, the entry price kits that we have, they're very nice too, and you can get a good you can get a good finish on them. They they take they take more work. That yeah, that's one right like there this. that Dan has in his hands. It's an unfinished version. Um, you can get a this can, one has that. The fret end sticking out because it's so dry in here. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And they, they take a little more work, but they're still quality kits. And then, you know, the other thing about everything that we sell is it's all backed by our lifetime promise. So if anything about it is wrong or you don't like it or whatever, call us up. We will replace it. I can make a guitar out of this. I know you can. It we've already got, is one. We've got some upstairs. They're nice. Okay. All right. Let's come back to our list. Um I'd consider one of those. Actually. Yeah, those are those are amazing. It's those a, are fantastic a, kits. I've never seen that's a new new thing to me in the whole game. Yep. Okay, Dan, we got a question from Jurgen Caps eighty seven. This is an Instagram question. It says, "I have a question regarding the need for fixing broken vintage Stratocaster bridge screws. I have two middle screws broken, and the guitar tech told me that it needs to be fixed." Um, Okay, so basically here's what the, here's what's going on. His two inside mill screws, it sounds like he has snapped the heads off the screws uh -huh. and he needs to know how to take them out um, in the most minimally invasive, invasive way possible. 
take off the bridge, okay, get the hardware out of the way and the strings, and it's see that's that tool we were just talking about. Yeah, the it, screw it extractor. Took the screw extractor and yeah, run it in there. I think that that extractor thing. I don't know where I put it. I have the image. I would like to have it, but I'm not going to hold up the show. It's perfect for that kind of screw size. Yeah, Susan just put it up on the screen. It's uh, if I'm right, it cuts in reverse. Okay. I'm not sure if that one does. Some do. Okay. So it, let me ask you this question. If if two of the center bridge screws are broken off, my guess is, is that somebody's twisted the heads off trying to take Probably. out the yep. take out the bridge. If if he's having that problem, how does he get the other ones out without breaking them? With a good with a good Phillips head that's sharp and not a cheap one. Okay. And the right size. Okay. I like, I have a Phillips head that's got about a shank like that in the handle, snap on. Okay. I've had it for 40 years. It's killer. It's a little bit dull, but I sharpen it. I like being up, up tall. I get a lot of uh -huh. torque up here. And you got to be in that thing and just move it a little bit. Okay. Take a breath. Get set again and do it. You pr you're pressing down. So press you're, down. You got to be a machine. Once you start easing it, it becomes easier and you won't break it off. Okay. You go on a tight screw and just go like that. Yeah. What do you expect? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And that thing can play without those screws in there anyway. Oh, I know. I, I, uh, I know. I'm sure, he just, I'm sure he just wants to do it. Four of them out. Yeah. Okay. Got a question from Kessel Run. This came from YouTube. Um, how to perfectly fix a lifting... 2012 Les Paul inlay. He said it came from the factory that way. It's the ninth fret, per ninth fret inlay. Um, nothing's perfect, but the best way would be to um, go to. I don't know what. I mean, you make a call and you glue it down. And we last year we did a video on that. If you go to the website, there is exactly that, and it's on Jim who works upstairs guitar. Firebird, I think, or something Yeah, it's like Firebird. That. Yeah, exactly. I think he yeah, had Steinberger it, tuners on it. They waxed off around that inlay. Blake yep. did it. Mm -hmm. I remember that because I opened it up and said, Blake, you do it. And he waxed around the inlay, held that plastic crown down while he was doing it so no wax got in it, let it dry, took some water-thin super glue, ran it down into the crack between the lift and the fingerboard, and it ran in there, and he'd already had wax paper ready. And instead of using a clamp or a call, what I might do is I'll go grab one of these things. Well, I wouldn't grab that one. Jeez, it's curvy. <laughs> I want this. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd cut a chunk of that off right. just to you be make a call. neck out of that. Yeah. So when I get these radius sanding blocks, they become calls. That's beautiful. Uh -huh. I know. Yeah. It's really a pretty piece of maple, isn't it? This is my bonus. Yeah, that's it. Huh. Mm -hmm. And Brock used a capo. Cool. Thinking. Awesome. Okay, uh, let's take one from the uh, from the comments here. Uh, Scott Jordan um, sent in one, and he said, "Would you recommend using a fret? Uh, well, I'm sorry. Would you recommend fret leveling with an 18 inch aluminum radius beam? Fret leveling with an 18 inch aluminum? Yes, sure. sure. Full size beam. Sure. Okay. Especially if you have a neck jig or some way to hold the neck where you really want it to be. That's right. the whole key. Okay." Yeah, I, um, definitely. That's where you get, if you do it with, if you start leveling with a leveling beam that's an inch wide and going across the board, keeping in line with the fretboard, then you smooth it with a radius block anyway. I think he's asking about the 18 inch radius beam, 18 aluminum radius beam, not the, not the, not the steel one we have, the other one. The sanding radius beams, yeah. right? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the expensive ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course they would. I have a drawer. Those are the ultimate. Okay. They're made, that's true, they're made out of aluminum. But Yeah, uh, they're really nice. They're there's great. something I dearly love about the wooden ones. I have a lot of these, and I cut them up. Like I, I know said. you do. Oh, there's so many tools. We can cut the aluminum ones up, too. I have. You can make tools out of these. Mm -hmm. 
Some of these make the best bridge plates I've ever had. It's really hard maple mm -hmm. bridge bridge plates. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dan, I uh, got one from the YouTube comments, uh, the YouTube community channel. Oh, it says, hi, Dan, I have a vertical crack on the rosewood side of my acoustic right by the end block. What kind of glue should I use and how the heck should I clamp it? Um, this is another one that I read and I prepped for. Susan has a couple of photos. You can think of any way you can, you can there's as many ways as you can think of to do it. I thought about it and found two of them. One would be, uh, I put some calls on the top and the back of the acoustic guitar and got in there with one of those swivel handle clamps which are really strong and clamped very firmly on the bit of the end block and then the kerfing where I wouldn't crush anything, but tight enough that I could take two scissor jacks because I have them. And they're my little jacks that fit in between the bar of the clamp and push a call shut because on that imaginary there's no crack there, but I'm imagining you don't see a lot of vertical cracks in wood like that. Then I wrapped it around, around it with a ratcheting web clamp. That one comes off the neck jig, but you have them around for all kinds of reasons. That worked great. I tightened it around, took a, a clothespin and got rid of the hinge on it and had two little wedges and I slid them in there and it worked great. I had a little couple of shims at the very end of those two, of the uh, clothespins, the little round dolls to add a little, and that worked. You want to grab that acoustic behind you and show us where that uh, vertical crack comes I'm thinking, I'm thinking on this side, but for no good, <laughs> I didn't know what side. I'm thinking it'd probably be right in here. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I don't want to see that one get cracked. Mm -mm. Nope that that that's a that's a really nice one. everything you touch around here, man, is a darn product. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that's what we do, right? I mean, this we, is killer. We make stuff to make guitars. This is one of our kits. That's one of our kits. That's one of our LE kits. That's the Koa um, limited edition kit. Did you put that together? I did not. Um, a builder in Canada, Rye Bear, put that together, and that was finished um, at uh, Vancouver. Um, uh, guitar finishing. Rob Bustos is the, it's beautiful. Put the finish on that. Ooh. Yep. So that that was a way to do that. And on a crack like that, I'm guessing it might be plywood guitar. Just wonder to crack mm -hmm. vertically across the grain. Okay, Dan, we, let's take a question from um, the uh, comments here. Boy, these things jump really fast. My apologies. Um, Okay. I'm waiting. I know. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, the commenter, is his, his user ID is Sleek Black, and he says, I'm refinishing a Strat. What is the best way to prep the body for a custom poly finish? Probably the same way that I'd prep it for a lacquer finish. I'm guessing I'm not a poly guy. Mm -hmm. um, with poly, you can prep it with a lot of different spray coatings. So he's he's in a refin. So first off, how do you take the how do you take the existing finish off? And it's poly. I don't know. He doesn't say what the existing finish is. He's going to put poly on it. I mean, maybe you don't have to take it off. You know, maybe it would be better to sand it out, and if it had dents, use some spot putty on it. Uh -huh. That's like a, that's what I would do. I try to not have to strip, especially if it was something I couldn't even strip off if I tried. Uh huh. And then spend two weeks and finally get to the scraper. wood and have lost any money I might ever have made. Yeah. I'd seal that with something. And is it a solid color poly or a clear? Uh, you know, he doesn't say it, it doesn't if go it's into a, that. Opaque man. I use, I paint it like a car. Uh huh. Spot putty and all the dents, sand it out. Spot putty is like Bondo, but it doesn't have two parts. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's thin and it, you can fill little imperfections with it and sand it out in 30 minutes. Okay. Paint it like a car. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So we got one from Chumley Shaver. This is another one from our YouTube community. Um, says, hi, Dan. How do you repair a stripped out little screw hole that holds a tele control plate? I'm sure most you must have a better solution than my plastic wood and toothpick fix. I, there's nothing wrong with 
plastic wood and toothpicks. I like the name Chumley, man. If, if he's the Chumley from Pawn Stars, I know, right? Send me your picture with an autograph uh -huh. right away. Um, there's nothing wrong with plastic wood or toothpicks. It depends what size hole and what size toothpick. You know, there's if you go to a hobby store, you can get lots of very small, small wooden dolls. And it's close to a toothpick, but bigger. And yeah. sometimes it'll fit the hole that's stripped out just by nature. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I would take that, chop it off with some fret cutters. And if it fit tight in the hole, I'd mark it. I'd press it down in there, mark it with a knife, and hope I could pull it back out. Mm -hmm. And I'd put glue down in that hole. Super glue? Any kind of glue you want. Um, super glue is great as long as you're not around a finish like this. Mm -hmm. If you're down here working on that, depends. You'd have to. I would always tape off around it if I'm using super glue because stuff happens. Mm -hmm. You know, super glue, you pull it out and you're ready to go, and a little piece of it flies out. A string out. of it, yeah. It goes up in the air yeah. and it lands, and it's a tiny little, like a little insect. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Plastic wood, there's much better things today mm -hmm. than the Bondo products. Plastic wood, we have wood filler that would probably fill that. It depends. Okay. All right. Okay, Dan, uh, this is a, a question that came in from uh, J. Brent Mack. Um, came in initially from our YouTube channel, and this is the one I showed you earlier. He, he sent a video in a little earlier today. Okay, I remember this one. It says, Dan, I... Just received my gripper truss rod wrench, and I'm disappointed to report that it's not working for me. I can't tell if it's not working strictly because the shank runs into the headstock, cocking it so much at an angle and not allowing the tapered hex to get down into it, or if additionally the taper's too long for the extension to get a grip. At this point, I feel like my options are to, one, cut away the interfering headstock material, and if that doesn't work, two, grind down the length of the tapered end. What would you advise, um, and what suggestions do you have? I would, if the guitar is adjusting down here, which yours is, it's got the holes too small to do anything. You can't even fit a little Popeye wrench in there, those little, mm -hmm. plus this is an, a socket. And I saw the photo. Yeah, it's on an eye. I'd house. elongate the hole with a rat tail file and a a gouge. Uh -huh. I'd work it, I'd make it longer. It doesn't have to drop down. That hole is just a complete route. It's a rabbit. Yep. I would do it this way. Like this. So you take the end of it where it's where it's just a pocket where they've just and I'd slope it. Yep. Because then that shoulder of that wrench will start to make it in there. I've seen the problem where the actual shoulder of that wrench hits something. You always have to take the string trees off. And uh, yep. there's also, we have elbow right angle grippers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which and then you, you need to make room to get in there. And do you think he would need to additionally grind down the, uh, uh, the wrench too? Or do you think that, that cause he's got too That's much. That's a whole different it? thing. First, he's got to get it in there. You can't, here's that. I saw the hole and it's, it's mauled from the wrong size wrench and no, no, no. Yep. And now it's hard to get it out because you can't get a grip. Okay. So the gripper is, for those that don't know, it's a tapered Allen wrench. And yep. we used to do this to Allen wrenches just for that job. And that's why the gripper came along. That probably was my idea because mm -hmm. I used to make them on Allen wrenches. Because then it's getting past the mauled part of the hole and deeper into the well where there's still some life to the walls. They still have a hexagonal shape. If you can imagine that, the hole's worn out on the front edge because people always slip and do a sloppy job there. And the gripper can be, you can feel it seat itself, then I take a hammer and tap it, give it a little bite in. And I'll, then, I'll, then you'll have to wiggle it out. It'll be, it'll be tight, set. Right. And you just wiggle it out, take a deep breath, you don't just do it. You have to really get, you want to clamp that and tap it again. And then you're in there and then it's the same as that screwdriver. You grab it and go slow. Just mm -hmm. try to turn it. It wants to get taken off. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what the gripper does, but the gripper doesn't always get deep enough into the hole to get where it's mauled because it's too long. And so we take it to the grinder and we carve our, we grind our grippers shorter on the tip mm -hmm. that lets it go farther in. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a custom gripper. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have more than one in a drawer. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. But sometimes you'll take that one. That's just perfect for most jobs. And that's what you'll use a long time. Then one comes along that uh, you just need to go grind a little bit more off. And you do, and then it works for that job. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work for the right. job. So then you them. end up having two or three grippers. But if you're in the business and doing it all the time, it's you yeah. can save truss rod nuts that people give up on. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, let's take another question from the uh, comments here. Oh, and by the way, hey, if you just turned it in, um, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we really enjoy it. We'd love to get your questions in the comments. Obviously, we've thank got spillover you. from... You know, it's fun. time's gone by. So these are super popular and we're very glad to have you. So thank you. Okay, Dan, uh, here's a question from Brent uh, Threevnot. I don't know. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, hey, Dan, can you relate? I'm sorry. Can you basically, Dan, tell us the toughest, most difficult repair you've ever taken on? Ooh, <laughs> there's been so many. Let's pick one. <laughs> They're all difficult. What's the most successful, tough, and difficult one? Sure, let's go with that. That's different. <laughs> um, one was a early 60s Stratocaster that got a brand new fingerboard that I made and put on it. It was a Lake Placid Blue peg head. And it came out perfect. No one could do, know that I did it. Cool. And I sanded it so smoothly and where you, because I put a new board on it. I can't remember the reason why, but I had to get it off, clean it, and I made that fretboard to a round lamb by running it at an angle over a table saw. And then you have a certain radius, but then you have to get in it with sanding blocks or a round bottom plane and make it fit the seven and a quarter inch radius. Because the original boards, those round lambs weren't, they're not bent. They're not curved over that, that curved maple. They are carved out. And I always heard it was because, for one reason, I think Leo th thought it was stronger to create a glue joint there that was captured, especially in that way. There's more glue service. Mm -hmm. A slab board that's just glued on a flat doesn't have that extra stress built into it. Mm hmm and uh, that's that's my most proud one, one of them. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the worst. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Who's asking that out there? Who answered that? Who asked that last one? Sorry. I, no, I, it's okay. I, no, they no. went all flew by. Sorry, man. They, they just, just the comments keep coming in. Okay. The, uh, the next question is coming from uh, Mike Socola. This is coming from our YouTube community. It says, what is the best way to correct a dent or a ding in a mahogany guitar body, which has a wine red color and a nitrocellulose finished? He has steam, a super glue trick, sand it and airbrush it, um, what, or some other approach. I'd say all, all those he already knows is what he's talking about. Yeah. All those techniques. I did bring some things in we could test with if we have the time. Let's take a couple minutes and give it a shot. I brought this piece of, because I read that one, this piece of an old SG. And uh, I, I just thought we'd see if we could swell it out a little bit. With the, I got a soldering iron. Did, yeah, let's not mess that up. <laughs> oh, I never... Yeah, let's not let anything happen. Yeah, that. I'll be taking this one home. Though. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> as soon as it gets some strap buttons. I think you'd know a guy could put some strap buttons on there, right? And I got this thing that we made for one of the workshops that we did with Ian, Ian Davlin. Uh huh. And uh, we made a bunch of these, and people are learning how to, to touch up colors. I would just try to. Take a dent like that 
or this and see if it steams out. It will if you get it. Get it not too hot, probably. And some water. I have hot water back here. Probably quite hot. See that? Can you see that little dent? I can. I just put it in there with a chisel and a hammer. Some of that will swell out just from getting it wet. I get a little bit more water. That's hot water. It's supposed to be. And I just steam on that. It'll plumping up, as Chelsea Clark says. She she says. That. Well, she invented that. She was showing steaming out a dent, and she says it plumpens it. And I laughed and laughed and made a joke of it. But it stuck, huh? Until one day she said, Dan, because she went to cosmetology school and she said that's a term for working on women's hair you're plumping it to give it more body okay <laughs> it's the truth i need that so that's all i do i like to have this will melt the lacquer a bit I don't know if you can see it, but it's. Can we, yeah? Can we zoom in on that a little bit? Can we see if that it's coming back a bit? Now the wood is not so much dented. The finish is gone because it got broken. Uh huh. You know what I'm saying? And you can go over a, a a brand new guitar that has no finish. You're in the white wood stage. Oh, I do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Before you. Start putting color, any color on it. You go all, all along, look for those little pecker tracks where your fingernails made a dent or anything, or something you laid down and it just touched it. And that you go around with a chisel tip. Yeah. I don't like this cloth as well as a good old t shirt. This is pretty coarse. It's not, uh -huh. I would use a, probably use one of these things. Oh, just, sure. a, just yeah. a q tip kind of thing? Sure. That'll hold a lot of moisture. Uh huh. I don't want to wreck it now because I want to plump in it. I want to plump it. Plump it up. But that's that'll steam good. Plumping, the new Luthery term. There you go. Comes from Chelsea Clark, who's working at the Gretsch Guitar Company, building a. Designer women's guitars. Okay. That's pretty cool. All right. So, Dan, let's take another one from uh, the comments. Okay. So, Corey we'll Taylor. Let dry out a little bit. Mess with it later. Cool. All right. So, Corey Taylor has sent this in a couple of times. I've seen it go by. Just haven't been able to catch it yet. It says, please help. Um, he has a guitar. It's an LTD TE401. It's a neck through. And the truss rod won't tighten or loosen, and he says it's broken about four inches down from where it enters the headstock. Um, and he asks if the process is different for a neck through guitar, presuming than a regular style guitar. You know, it looks like you have to get the fingerboard off and excavate that rod and re clean up, reroute it probably. I mean, you can make a mess taking the truss rod out of a guitar like that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get the fingerboard off first, then you're going to have to get whatever is holding that truss rod in. That's the filler strip on top. And mm -hmm. if that's all torn up, then you have to uh, put a new strip of wood in it and route it for a new truss rod. It's a lot of work, mm -hmm. but it's done all the time. And then put the finger back on You get, clean up your finish. You got a torn yeah. up hole where you took a truss rod out and it chipped some wood there and it yeah. took some here. The grains are going like that. 
So then you go in with a wider bit and a fence and a router and you create new walls. Mm -hmm. You plow the right depth, but you're taking wood off both sides and it's straight. Then you make whatever material that you want to use to put in there. So do you ever take it out, replug all the holes and redrill a brand new truss rod slot? Uh, you can't drill a truss rod slot. I don't mean drill, I meant route, sorry, my bad. Oh yeah, then you got that piece of wood. And once that's all done, then you cut into that and install your rod. Uh -huh. So you've rebuilt the neck inside. Mm -hmm. And it's for, it's a labor of love and it's for a guitar that you really want to right. keep. And it's a serious woodworker job. Okay, all right. We've uh, all done it. I, I, I think just based on the way he worded his question, he knew, <laughs> he knew he was in for a big job. Yeah. It is. Um, okay, hey Dan, um, oh, this is from Tommaso by the way. I uh, came in from Facebook. Hey Dan, um, I filled the grain well enough on an ash body. This is my first ever build. And now after splay, spraying the clear primer, I'm getting some orange peel effect. Um, I've heard that I can fix it with super glue. Any suggestions or should I go back to bare wood and start over? Oh, he's, and he's gonna finish this with a translucent color. So he's on bare wood, he's gonna go with a translucent. On bare wood right now. He's on with bare a wood. a sealer coat, a clear sealer coat. Yep, so he's pore filled. Put a sealer coat on, and he's getting orange peel in his sealer coat. See, orange peel to one person might mean a different thing than it does to me. Orange peel really looks like the peel of an orange, mm -hmm. and that's different than pits. And I think what you're looking at might be uh, humidity problems. Mixing of the lacquer and the thinner. I mean, if so, are you spraying out of a spray can or a gun? But if it's I orange, see, considering it's his first ever, I presume he's going off of aerosols. But orange peel, orange peel isn't a bad thing. You sand it out. Yeah, right. Orange it, peel it, is is normal, it's just, right? It's, I mean, some people call it spray wave. Uh -huh. The power of the spray gun, the way it atomizes the lacquer and flows it out, and that can be controlled with thinners. Thinning lacquer, making the lacquer thicker, your air pressure. But you can sand that and spray another coat on it. If you go through, that's what you'd have to worry about. And if there's color on the wood, and you're saying it's bare wood, so you might be saying... Yeah, he hasn't put color in yet, I don't think. Whenever you break the surface of any finish, mm -hmm. something's going to look different. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, let's take another one from the uh, comments. Um, Kevin asks, I have an old Spanish guitar with a bowed neck, no truss rod. Is there any way to straighten the neck? A bowed neck, no truss rod, old Spanish guitar. Mm -hmm. It's either bowed up or bowed back. Yep. You take off the fingerboard if you can. And if you can bend the neck straight in the direction you want it to go. And then plow through that with a router and put stabilized wood in there or carbon fiber, then you'd have a st stiff neck and then you start from there. Just try to get it straight. No truss rod, you're dealing with two pieces of wood glued together and they're warping. Mm -hmm. And you don't have any way to control it. Take the fingerboard off, if you can hold the body, take the fingerboard off, clean the fretboard and the, the, the neck portion and pull it back and glue the fingerboard back on. Okay. Maybe pull it back even farther so you're going to a back bow, and that's when you glue the fingerboard on. And with a little practice and experience, you'll find that can straighten the neck for a long mm -hmm. time. Okay. Without right. a truss rod. Cool. Okay. So we've got a question here that relates to acoustic guitars. Hey, Dan and the Stumac team, happy new year. Um, is there a difference between the sound when it comes to non-scalloped and scallop bracing? That's um, a pretty personal thing. How do you know? I don't think if I had a guitar, if I had two guitars and one had super glued, no, one scalloped? One scalloped, one is and not one scalloped. Not I might not hear it, but I know guys that would, or girls, yeah. people. The yeah. best players, yeah, they know. 
I think. Yeah. And the scalloping braces used to be a thing that you don't hear of anymore, I don't think. Right. Because Martin came out with all kinds of guitars made like the old days. Some were scalloped and some weren't. I don't think I'd hear the difference, but you might. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in the end, it really just comes down to, to lightening, you know, lightening the top. And there's multiple ways to get to a light top, right? Yeah. It would, but if it was sanded thinner, but the braces weren't scalloped. Yeah. Like on mine, I don't, I don't scalp my bracing. I mean, I just build it light to start with. I mean, they're just tapered to right to get go. To okay. me, scalloping braces, it seems like it would weaken that bracing. On an already in built that guitar? Area where, yeah. Okay. If it was built with that in mind is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'd right. be building it, under tension to avoid that. Yeah. Is that right? It doesn't say. I mean, I know you would if you wanted to build oh, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would to, build it that way. Thought, yeah. I'm not going to scallop it. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, my whole way of I when I think about the bracing of a guitar, I mean, a lot of times people think of it as as you know, it's structural integrity to the top, right? Which it is. But the other way I really think of it is, is like if the bridge is a brace, right? The bridge is the brace in your guitar, and it's the thing that wobbles. It's the thing that where all the energy comes from. So I think about the rest of my braces more like a spider web. Like you know, if it, if a if a bug or anything hits a spider web. It ripples through the whole thing, and the spider's aware mm -hmm. of it, right? So think about your guitar top like that. That's really what your braces are. Your braces are carrying the energy out to the rest of that top. So when you excite that bridge, you really want to get the most energy as efficiently as possible out to the rest of it. And that's the way I think about it. So I don't do scalloping. I do almost like this you whole, know, I do a lattice you underneath You do something my, totally different. Totally a modern different. way of bracing that a lot of the old timers are going, oh, I don't want that. Yeah, exactly. It's not the... But, um, Two it's all right, in yeah. the sound of the guitar, man. I played one of the ones you, the one that I had in my shop. Yeah, that was killer. Yeah. I just never played yes. a guitar that had that kind of. All guitars are different. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, if you had some people have thirty guitars and play them all and keep yeah. them and just. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so let's go on to our next question here. This comes in from Man in Suitcase. I presume it's from Instagram, based on the way the handle's created. Um, gonna scratch build my first guitar. What's the best part to start with, the body or the neck? I would start with uh, the body. It's a much easier thing to do. And the neck has more components and more joints, things you have to cut and do just about right with the body. Assuming it's nice and sanded flat or not, not final sand, a bit plain. And you're designing this, you're going to draw your shape. Mm -hmm. And I think the most, that the body's first, and you're going to get a center line on that. Yep. Whatever your shape is, you got to start with a center line on a rectangle piece of wood, let's say. And everything's going to come off that. The neck mm -hmm. has to be on line, all the bridge holes. And then it will be much easier to make your neck. Mm -hmm. And that was your idea, Brock. Yeah, well, yesterday. I think so. I mean, it sounds to me like if you're scratch building, this is the first time. It sounds like... That's an easier thing to take on. Yeah, I mean, certainly if you haven't got a lot of experience building the that is because when you get to building the neck, it's it's a much more precise type of work, and you've got to be very, very accurate. But, the, the, you know, it's the accessible. The only truly accurate thing on the body is getting that neck in line to the bridge, but any other mistakes can be covered pretty yeah. easy. Yeah, everything else can be straightened Paint, out. Bondo. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. If you, yeah, if you, start with the body. Yep, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, let's just take one here. But I, I wouldn't give up if it didn't go right. Okay, let's take a question from the from the comments. This is from David Ross. Um, sorry, I haven't screened these too carefully, but let's just, let's just give it a shot and see how it goes. Hey, Dan, I was wondering how many fret jobs, refret, level, crowning, dressing, etc., did it take for you to really uh, – for did it take for you to really get fretting under your belt? Um, by the way, the early wine neck jig has helped me tremendously. Well, that's nice to hear. I love to hear that. It's uh, the neck jig. It's one of my favorite tools. Right. It's just done things that I can't do without it. Um, God, I'd say 100, maybe 50. It's all on the person. If you're coming out, I've got guys my age or in, in their 50s that have been masters in woodworking in other areas 
in uh, plane making and cabinet making and Jay Hosteller, vice president at Stew Mac, master woodworker. And his, he's just, uh, and so, so there. So 50 to 100, you think? 50, okay. maybe. All right. Okay. But those guys could take it and do it right on the second time. That's okay. what I was getting at is a, when you really know a shop tools and wood. So the learning curve is different easy. based on everybody, based on how much experience it's how well have. can you measure and cut to that measurement. Okay. So we've got one from George. This is from our YouTube community area. It says, uh, uh, hey, Dan, if you perform a fret job, is it also possible that you might have to replace the nut? Um, well, almost always. Mm-hmm. Most jobs you'll replace the nut and the saddle on an acoustic. Or if it's a valuable vintage piece or special to the family, you and you can carefully get the nut out, you could shim it up. You can refret it, but the frets are going to be taller than a well-playing nut, I think. If the frets are worn and but the and the nut's going to be worn with it, you put new frets on and the strings will buzz right on the first fret. But you can shim those up. I've done it with Ivory and bone nuts on, even on old fenders. My favorite chim is you can get under these nuts with a thin blade, and it, it just gives a little you know where you can wedge and knock and tap. I use banjo skin, calf mm -hmm. skin. It's translucent. It's kind of whitey shallow. It looks mm -hmm. like bone, mm -hmm. and it's about the perfect thickness. And you cut a little strip of it and soak it in a little bowl with super glue and just let it sap it up. And put it on a piece of wax paper to dry. And when it's dry, it's just perfect. And it looks like a nut on the edge. So it's, it's not little, gluey. It's just super, it's just it's it's super dry hard. and just kind of like it's a, a... It's a nature-made substance. It's like wood. Mm -hmm. It's a cow skin mm -hmm. full of a hard glue penetrated into it. Mm -hmm. It's got a quality. And it makes a hell of a shim. Cool. You almost always have to change this. Bridge saddles on an electric and have to raise them up and the nut. Okay, awesome. Okay. Unless you're asked totally not to by the customer. What's that? Unless the customer does not want that nut replaced. Then right. You, then you can get around that. Okay. That could lead me right back off into talking about the Joe Glazer nut dust stuff because that's we have a product that Joe Glazer came up with. Right, we talked about that last time. I know, but it's still worth telling anybody that's asking about a nut. Yeah. Because a worn-out nut can pretty well be repaired beautifully with this stuff. comes in black, off-white, and white, and it's real bone with magic powder in it that he won't tell us what it right, is. Right, exactly. The, the mystery ingredient. I don't ingredient. want to know. Yeah. I'm happy that it works. Okay. So, all right. So, we got another one from the YouTube comments. Austin has sent this in a couple of times. It says, um, how can I accurately reduce the width? of a fret wire's crown, not the tang, the original width is 70 thousandths of an inch. Um, and it's for a 60s moss right. And you want to reduce that size? Sounds like he wants to, to reduce the width of the fret. Has that person looked for mandolin wire? Uh, he does not say. So that's the whole question. Well, that's, that, that's pretty darn hard to do. Yeah, so to replace the fret is essentially what you're... Well, is he trying to match one fret, or are we trying to... Again, I mean, of, he says a fret wire's crown. I presume it's one fret wire. Or I'm sorry, I'm sure, I'm, I presume the way he's worded the question is one fret. Then you would clamp it into uh, a small vise, like the nut and saddle vise that has tapered jaws, and hold it right at the top. You clamp it by the tang and get it clamped carefully and you would file it the same amount off each side very carefully with a smooth mill file and a firm hand and you'd make a stroke and a stroke on the other side and measure it. You can do it if it's just one fret. Yeah, I think I think it's already in the guitar though. You would take it out, Ooh, do that to it, and well, put it back. Man, I don't know why I'd want to do that. Yeah. If he has to ask that question, it might be worth taking it to a shop and having someone see, why does he want to do that? Okay. Cool. Why would you want to, on a guitar, just make one fret thinner than all the rest? I don't know. Doesn't say. 
All right, so I, I got another one here. I'm gonna throw another one. Interesting question, but it's a hard one to answer. Understood. Okay, Nickified Guitars, Guitars Tech and Repair says, uh, where can I get one of those cleat holders with the magnetic um, thing that you demonstrated in the uh, with the magnetic foil? I think what he's referring to is is the the cleat tool that you used yeah, in that I video. Yeah, I don't think we're guitar. carrying that. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe we are. I think if we started to and then never did. I don't know that we ever carried that. It started out, we were certainly using a Joe Glazer has it, if he's uh, selling mm -hmm. that. That came from Joe Glazer. It's a little plastic tool mm -hmm. with magnets in it. It's got two little magnets, and it's shaped to take your um, patch that you're putting in. Yep. And it's... Uh, Clever little tool. I, I thought we were selling that, but I haven't paid. I don't pay a lot of attention these days like I should do. What's in or out in the catalog? We don't even have a catalog. I don't think. Okay. All right. Cool. Lost down in the shop. All right. Okay, Dan. Let's go to the next one. Um, this was from Sam Kim. Do I need the fret kisser only to shave the few frets down a bit, or do I need more tools to do that? Only to shave a few frets down. Do I need the fret kisser only to shave the frets down a bit? It sounds like he wants to do more than one fret. Mm. The fret kisser thing. It's really made to do uh, three different lengths, which on a guitar will pretty much let it rest on two frets while it's cutting. The idea is that you have a straight edge that spans three frets. Is this kind of what you're thinking of? And yes, you could you could take a neck and a neck that was perfectly flat and level but had high frets, and you could use the right side of this, and you can knock down a spot here and a spot there. But I don't think you would use this tool to level the whole fretboard. Right. You'd there want a longer one, a longer diamond or sandpaper on a block. But this tool could do wonders on singular buzzes on a fret on a fret that you have on a fret job you're doing or that a player even has a buzz, you could get rid of it with this. It's a pretty easy tool to use, I think. So if he was looking at, you know, doing more than one fret, realistically, what tools might he want? Um, block of hardwood and sandpaper, a real le fret leveler. We have fret leveling files. We have diamond fret levelers. And I'd rather have one that's a 16 or 18 inches long then only have one that was maybe eight inches long. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to have the full length when I can get it, at least on a guitar. If it's that long, it can also do a bass. Mm -hmm. But when you're taking a file that long and running it on long neck, it's not staying f as flat as it could because it's not on all bearing on the same surface. Okay. All right. So Great the tool, though. Yeah. This thing. Yeah. One of our top sellers. Is um, it really? Yeah. That, that and the Z-File are two of our, they're kind of neck and neck for our, for our well, most popular. This one too, that little rocker thing. Yeah, yeah we sell tons of those this rockers. This is like a machine yeah. tool. The edge. That's like a perennial. You cut yourself on this. Uh -huh. That's machine. You could almost use it like a scraper, huh? Ooh. Um, no, you really could. Yeah. Um, okay, this was from Perez Hernandez. This is coming in from the YouTube community. It says, hello, I've been meaning to uh, uh, refret an old Spanish guitar I've owned for about six years now. Both the fretboard and the frets are worn out since I played the heck out of it throughout the years. So regarding my question, I'd like to know what are the correct tools to do a complete fret job and how would you go about removing the fretboard from the neck? Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, boy, there's so many tools that every everybody's shop would have different tools. Um, there's a case where I would go for one of uh, what's come out is the... Um, we have a fret kit, right? A, yeah, a, sort of a basic starter kit, uh, and then there's a bigger set. kit. That's it. I would, fretting if you set. want to do a job that big, I'd get, I'd start out with a set like that of tools, study it, and see if it's got what you want. And why would you have to take the fretboard off? I don't I'm know. Not, I don't know. I think I, I, I and I'm, I'm confused about the fretboard is worn if it's on a, if it's a, um, uh, uh, you well, know, a Spanish worn, guitar. He's probably got an ebony board on it, right? So I mean, I can't imagine mm, he's worn an ebony board with not a lot of strings. Spanish guitar it is. A lot of them wouldn't have ebony. Yeah. A lot of 
that type classical shape, Spanish types of guitars. If, if it was an import or a low level one, it could have all kinds of wood. Huh. You know, I could see it being pitted, but it's pretty rare to want to fill the pits in on a worn fretboard. It's better to fret it and play it, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we got budget guitarist from So our... the answer there was look at the kit of what kind of tools you need to begin to do that job. Right? Sure. And Absolutely. if you think you can and want to do it. Okay. All right. So budget guitarist sent in a question. He says, uh, hi, Dan. I recently bought the Stumac diamond fret crowning file with 150 and 300 grid sides. Which do you recommend for fret crowning under which circumstances? Oh, I probably would lean mostly to the 300 grit myself because the fret work in our shop is mostly um, refrets. Uh, so it's a brand new fret job. And if we're doing it as well as we're supposed to be doing, you often get the joy of finally leveling these frets. And we're doing it in our neck jig. Somebody else would do it in a different way which means it's under tension this whole time. And it's a beautiful thing when you've leveled the frets that you put in, but there's nothing to take off. You put you in a color your frets with a magic marker so you can see where it's going. And to do all that and almost see nothing and just use sandpaper and then unscrew the neck on all that and it doesn't go like this. Dang. It just sits there like it's ready to be played. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question at all? Yeah. It does. All right. So here's another one. This comes in from Milo. Uh, this is more YouTube. Um, it says, when I hammer in frets on an instrument, the ends of the frets always peel up. What can I do to fix this? Um, I know Brock would say practice. Yeah, I would. Because he did say that. I know. Um, there's so many ways. If you, if you clamp your frets in, they're going to probably be less likely to come up on the ends or in the middle. If you're going to hammer them in, you probably want to have a fret wire that's a little more over radius than your actual fretboard radius. So it wants to stay down on the ends. I like to start a fret wire in on one side, get it tapped, and bring it over to the other side and get it tapped, and get a little tap, and get a little tap and try to get the ends down and work to the center a bit. The whole wire is gonna stretch a bit, but it's all in how thick is the tang and how wide is the slot. Mm -hmm. And I would start with one little piece of fret wire and see how it fit to begin with. Mm -hmm. If I'm fretting a guitar, I don't have a piece of fret wire here, but I'll cut it with the fret nippers on the end about a half an inch and it'll bend up because I haven't cut all the way through it. And that's a test piece that you can put down in there. You can super glue them down. If, mm -hmm. they, if you can clamp them and glue them. Press them and glue them, huh? Yeah, a lot of mm -hmm. people do that. Yeah. A lot of factory fret jogs I've seen have pretty much been quickly held down by super glue. It's not mm -hmm. a good way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's practice, really. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's just one of those things. And just bending the wire, right? I'm assuming anybody that wants to get a good job has to have some, some way to radius the wire well. In the old days, it was bending them with pliers with a notch ground in it mm -hmm. for years and years. And you get used to it. You bend and you move it, bend and you move it and bend it. And you can get it perfect. Then along came the fret bender and man. Yeah. Maybe and that's the favorite tool of the world right there. Yeah. Yeah. Something everybody needs. Um, hey, if you've just uh, tuned in, um, thank you. We have 399 people that are currently watching this, and and I've seen that number bouncing around for the last while. So thanks, thanks for doing this. Thanks for sending in your comments. Um, we really, you know, we welcome it. We love it. Um, we're trying to get to as many of them as we can, and uh, we just really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, Dan uh, Jay Heil has got one for us. Um, he says, I just finished refretting a 1936 Biltmore arch top. And I was very nervous about hammering in um, at the 15th fret and higher over the body of the instrument. With the F-holes, um, he was unable to support the interior of the guitar. Um, he did his best to hold the fingerboard as, as, as he could. But what advice would you have on doing a job like that? Well, I'd be more, I'm more inclined to use my little um, 
slot cleaning tools and little double bladed Japanese fret saw and the refret saws to, to clean out the slots or a Dremel tool with a really tiny bit. And I'll take those last frets from here up to here and everything's taped off and I'll get my Dremel tool and I'll Dremel them. And if it's binding, I'm on the inside of the binding. I'll clean them so they're clean and the fret that I want to put in there presses in real nice. But I don't have to pound it in. Okay, so you just press it in gently. I like to press it in. Some people would say, oh, you're going to lose tone there. But that's different. When you're making the guitar, you can fret that whole section on a block before it ever goes on the body. Right. There's so many ways of making a guitar. That could be an integral, strong part of what you want to drive that body. Mm -hmm. But as far as whacking on one that has a clearance under it, just be careful. You could you have to make a nice little call that's tapered. It's a snug fit that doesn't want to pry it up. Mm -hmm. And I'm always being the neck jig. So my body's suspended up on the little mm -hmm. supports, and I can get underneath the back of that heel with a clamp and a, a padded call. Mm -hmm. And I can either clamp my frets in that way, or that's I can also put a scissor jack under there and I often do right on the beam of the of my neck jig. Uh huh. And I've got a leather padded call that comes up under the block on the back. Uh huh. And paper it off to, to not scratch anything and tighten that scissor jack and then you can do some hammering. Okay. okay. You can't use the Bob Taylor fret buck because you can't get it mm. in there. I mean, there's no hole to put it into, right? But uh, if you did it a lot and there's people that do a lot more of those than I would you'd know how much you could get away with with the hammer. Yeah. Okay. You'd size the fret wire just right. Cool. All right. So Casper Luthier from Instagram says, what glue do you prefer uh, for gluing on the fingerboard? Mm -hmm. I don't do a ton of building, but when I do, I would be very happy to use hot high glue. You have to be jigged up really well because... You don't have a lot of time. I like Gorilla Glue. Gorilla Glue is really strong, and I think it doesn't slip. I think it creates a joint like epoxy, mm -hmm. and it's it's permanent. That's like using epoxy. Mm -hmm. I have nothing against epoxy except it's messy. Mm -hmm. And epoxy would be a wonderful glue. I wouldn't tend towards tight bond. I wouldn't test, tend towards the... That fist glue, mm -hmm. I like this for a lot of things. Once I was using this to put fretboards on, but then I heard the community start saying, well, we had some problems with some slippage or creeping on that joint where the fingerboard is next slipping a bit. And yep. things. So, uh, okay. High glue, man. Learn right. high, Learn to use hot high glue is, and do it as much as you can. Yep. And start from an early age because yep. it's, it's inexpensive. It's there. You can make it. And you're never out of it. And it's got a little ever, learning curve, but it's not that glue, bad. I brought a little high glue, glue thing if anyone wanted to see that. Oh yeah, but right. We got a well, lot of tell questions. them about your tell them about your little thing. Tell them about your, about your machine there. You should almost ask the people out there. Yeah, Rachel, would you plug that that thing in? Uh -huh. This is my Christmas present from my buddy Don McCrosty. That. Ran the Stu Mac shop. He's a world class mandolin maker. He built every jig and tool. And it's a little, it's like a cement mixer. And you can put shellac in this. And I swear we should make a kit of this. You can put shellac in this or high glue. Uh huh. And yeah. it, it mixes it. Yeah. So I'm going to make a little bit. You're going to mix a little up right now, huh? huh. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, it's great. How are we doing on time? Oh, you know, we've got more questions than we've got time. So let's just, you know, see how far we get. Now, if you had about that much high glue, it's uh, right there. I'd probably want to put that much water, about an equal amount, 
and not another full that much water, but one about here, about one and 1.8 volume glue to water. Mm -hmm. And these are the coolest thing I just found. Yeah. Does uh -huh. everybody know that there's a Sharpie pen that's... Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, like a traditional ballpoint. Paul gave me one for Christmas, and it was my favorite present. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's always there. And it there's, always, there's all kinds of good Sharpies. Yeah. So I'd add the water to it. This could be shellac, but it might be a little different mixture. Let's stir it up a bit. And it's hilarious, but it really works. And it makes, it puts high glue or shellac into solution really fast. You can actually mix shellac ready to use in probably 20 minutes. Yep. Yeah. Because you're going to put it on there. And then I'm going to bring in my desk lamp with an incandescent bulb, 80 watts or 100 watts and warm it and you can go off and do something and it's just gonna if it, just it gets dissolves little, it. yeah i mean it's, it's constantly moving mm -hmm. it, and eventually this will fall off in clumps mm -hmm. and then it'll be ready to heat it and that's high glue yeah you got to heat it though i mean it's, this is only part one you got to heat it after that i got some heated back here in a pot that's there's your liquid high glue. Yep. And this is probably months old, and I haven't heated it in at all since I took it out, but it's been quite some time. It would normally be labeled. Mmm. No, oh, it smells good. Yeah, sometimes. And it's... Uh, what does it smell like? Smells mm. like animal. Smells like meat. Sort of. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's not a putrid. Move that uh, container out of there. See, I could put that there, and or I could leave a drop of it, and just leave that, and say tomorrow I'm going to use this glue, and if it's dry and hard and chips with my knife, it's ready. Otherwise, you throw this out every couple of months, right? Uh huh. Yeah. You, you don't want it when it has mold in it. No. You this don't want to is use still the one that's got mold in it. I can tell by the smell. Uh huh. That's I wanted to show that on high glue. Thomas DeLello said though in the comments, "Don't eat it." But you know what though? That's you could, but you it, could. It's basically inside, gelatin. Man. Yeah. You'd, something would happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you use Knox gelatin, you can use that kind of as a replacement for high glue. So, okay. So, let's. Oh, Rachel, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Rachel and Susan are back here wearing their masks. I'm telling you. We can't wear the mask and talk on TV. Okay. Yep. But, um. All right, ready for another one, Dan? Yep. All right, so Eddie Lagos, um, this is from our last live stream, asked a question. I've seen this question in, in today's live stream, too. Um, it says, I want to start doing fret work. What's the difference between the fret puller and the Stumac Precision fret puller? Not sure which one to get. I looked at that one, and I, br I brought them down. Because I just got one of these. These are relatively new, I'd say, in the last year. Yeah. Things come out new that I don't really even realize we have sometimes. Mm -hmm. Which one is that? That's the precision. This is the, the, uh, the newer one, which uh -huh. has a steeper angle in it. Yep. That's the precision fret puller. Precision, that just means this thing is ground. It's... Uh, it's like a steroid or something. It's got machine ground edges in it. It's thinner. And this is the less expensive, but the kind I've used for years. Sometimes you'll get these and use them and use them and use them, and you might get a chip if you mm -hmm. cut the wrong guitar string with them. Don't use these for cutting Don't guitar, cut guitar strings, strings with those. Know. Yeah. But uh, th this jaw is a little thicker. It's a pair of end nippers that's ground almost flush on the top. Mm -hmm. End nippers have a, a V-shaped jaw. You know, they come together as a V. There's mm -hmm. 
and it gets ground off, but the, the rest of the grind is still on the bottom. So that is a steeper grind angle. We can take a fret out here if you want to, because I, I did. Go for it. Can you see this one overhead, Susan? Uh, I can see from overhead, yes, but probably uh, from the side. Where it is, I'm getting a touch. Yeah. I'm going to move my jean bag. My friend makes. I like these. that fret rest. That's one of my oh, favorites. These are killer. This yeah, is that's the my jean. favorite. I call them the jean bag. Yeah. Because jean and because they look like they're made them. out of a pair of jeans. Yeah. Our buddy makes these. He invented it. It's, oh, I see. Let's take a couple of frets out. I tried these two and I got them both out. I'm going to press deep down in and try to see if I can get under that fret right on the end. Can we see this? Oh, yeah. We see it real good. And I feel like I'm going to cut a little metal. I got to press deeper into the wood. So you're not you're not heating first. You're just going straight to. Nope, the... I'm just going straight. I know I know how these will come out. Okay. So I fought that a little bit. I'm going to do the same thing with these. And I'm su assuming that it'll get under with a little less damage. Yep. See the difference? Mm-hmm. I'm going to be throwing this fret away anyway. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm taking it out because I don't want it. But I think that's the difference of precision and normal duty. Now here's, that one went under nice, but nicely, but it uh, wants to pull a little chip out. We've got something to and deal with I, that too. I could heat it. Mm -hmm. And I generally do heat frets when I take them out, but this is just a, it's laying around the shop and something we can use for doing something like that. Yep. I think uh, these are just fine once you're underneath it. For walking across. Let's see how these do it. I like this better for getting under it, but I like this better for walking it out because it's thicker jaws. Uh -huh, lifts Once it up a little bit Once the fret is lifted now, I like to have that taper. Yep. I'd want both of them. Okay. If money was the difference, I'd take this one and okay. use the heck out of it. Okay. All right. Good but question. I'm that kind of guy. If I've got... A tool like this, and I might take that to the grinder and sharpen it even more and take my chances. Say, uh -huh. oh, I'm going to take it a little bit farther. Okay. And then you get one that's really works, but it doesn't last forever. Uh huh. All right. You can't expect any fret tools to last forever. They get too much work biting metal. Mm hmm. Takes its toll on them, especially stainless wire. You yep. almost want to charge the customer for a pair of cutters to cut, cut that stuff. Okay. All right, Dan, I got a question uh, from Vlad. Um, this is coming in from our YouTube community page. Mm -hmm. um, it says, hey, Dan, I really like your work and enjoy all your Stumac videos, and I'm a fan of Stumac tools. What thoughts and recommendations uh, would you share with someone who decided to do his first fret leveling? Um. Study up. Just that you're thinking about it means uh, the next thing you have to do is find out how it's done. I would um, I would get any information on it that's online. I've got DVDs that show how to do it. I've written books on it. Other people have. Yeah, yeah. You could spend a lot of money just buying books and videos that would have been a tool. Knowing what I know today, I would I'd go on the internet and and I'd search some of the people doing it and see how good it was. Yeah. You can tell quickly what's no good. Uh, yeah, I tell you, you know, I think you know one way or another, you pay your tuition. So it seems to me like to get quality information and know the you book. You pay your or, dues. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's either you're going to make mistakes and learn through trial and error, or you're going to or you're going to or you're going to get knowledge from somebody that has the knowledge. I mean, so what, you know, one of the two ways it, it, 
there's no shortcuts to that. No, yeah. there isn't. And, so, um, one of the best places I know to go to look up stuff like that, which is just huge and it's always growing, is uh, my buddy Frank Ford's got a website mm -hmm. called frets.com. It can't be simpler. Mm -hmm. He was lucky to get that, but he got it a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. And he started, I do it too, but he just does it to death, taking photos and chronicling all the stuff that he does. and. You go to frets.com and you'll see it it's on the internet and you'll get the big page, big in the index page, and go to down in the center there's a box that says items for luthiers. And you go there and it's so organized this and that. And you can watch a lot of jobs being done mm -hmm. or see photos with captions. And mm -hmm. that's one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and obviously we've got 400 videos we out got there the, too. We got the stuff. Tons right? of videos. The best way would be to find a buddy in your town that did it mm -hmm. and talk yourself into letting let me watch you. Right. Help me. That's what that's my mentality. When yep. I started, I went and found people that were good at stuff. All right. So hey, we're getting down to it here. We've only yeah. got a few minutes left. So I'm gonna okay. hand end you just a couple more. So Ryan Bruce Fluff from Riff's Beard. Beards and Gear, who we've done some some collabs with on uh, uh, YouTube and stuff, ha sent in a question. And it's if you could keep only one guitar that you've had across your bench over the years, what would it be and why? Man, that's like, what's your favorite tool? One guitar, there's been a lot of things. That, like that, that would be somewhat easy. I've had a lot of valuable guitars across my bench, but the one that I had was uh, here six or seven years ago and it was a Stumac video of getting Mike Bloomfield's Telecaster in my hands in my shop to do some work on it so it could be sold at auction and that's the one that had been converted to left-handed mm -hmm. and the original of the person called me wanted to know if I would convert it back to not being cut on a bandsaw oh and that's what he wanted to do. He wanted you put a piece of wood back in it? Yeah, well, you, one could. You could put a piece well, of wood could, in it, but... then have the perfect finisher, put the absolute finish. And uh, I said, well, I'd have to look at it first. I just wanted to see it. Yeah. And it came in, and it needed work. I did all the setup work, but Mike Bloomfield's Telecaster that recorded at the Newport Folk Festival and played on Bob Dylan's the record that summer, uh -huh. Rolling Stone, it's a guitar that played like a Rolling Stone and all that stuff. And I saw him, the first time I saw Mike Bloomfield play was on that guitar. Mm -hmm. And that was before Newport. That was in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the Michigan Union. We were just out of high school and not going to college, probably 18 or 19. And he played at the Union Ballroom with Nick Gravenides at the Mike Bloomfield's Rhythm and Blues Band. And he told all us guys a couple years younger than him, go out and listen to B.B. King. You got to hear B.B. King. And, of course, we all did. Right. And then he played that guitar with the Butterfield Band. And when I first saw Butterfield Band, that was it. But, and to have that come back after all those years and have it in the shop, it was like being in church. Right. Right. Opening the case. Oh, the glow. Yeah. yeah. And Yorma came in and played on that. He loved it. Uh-huh. He came in and played on that. I got a video of that somewhere. That's cool. That's, that's, that's my favorite. Mike Bloomfield's Blonde Telly. Cool. Fun. What a great story. Okay. Let's uh, take a couple about the business of Luther. So these two questions are kind of almost the same. So one comes in from uh, Armont Guitars from Instagram, and one comes in from Nate Lamb. But like I say, they're pretty similar. So I'm going to just read um, the one from Nate Lamb. Mm -hmm. It says, my dad opened a small repair shop here in Fort Worth in 1976, and I've had the privilege to work with him every day and learn from his experience. Something that we occasionally struggle with is pricing our work and keeping our prices up to date and competitive, yet fair to our customers. So my question is, how do you price your work, and what other business advice would you give the next generation of luthiers and repair pros? Wow. Um, pricing your work, you have to know how much you need to make. 
You know, if you're in the guitar business, how much money do you need? Because you're self-employed. Do you need a week or a month? How much money a year do you need? And this is something Frank Ford explained to me once. My great buddy Frank. He knows everything. It's simple. If you just have to, here's how much money I need to have to, to do what I want. Here's how many hours I have to do it. You divide the two together, and that tells you how much you have to charge realistically. And that can be a pretty grim figure sometimes. And then you find ways to uh, make it happen, but not always be able to charge that much. Because mm -hmm. you might find it was $80 an hour or $100 an hour. And I can't do that in my shop. Mm -hmm. Well, some places you probably have to, though. Some places some you markets have to. You probably have Depends to where you survive. live. Yeah. You know, um, if you're in LA you, or New York or big you markets. You certainly want to find out as many other places what their charges were if they'll tell you, and most of them do. It's yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. You have to do your homework. You could call places, look online, find mm -hmm. out how many places list the prices that, that, that they do. Mm -hmm. A I've lot been, of places. Do. I was just told I should be raising my prices yeah. by other luthiers in the business, my colleagues that say, geez. And I've just, ne I've always been afraid to. Mm -hmm. You get to a certain point that works, but uh, I'm thinking about that now, understanding that yeah. I might be a sap. Well, you know, I mean, I think there's always you that balance, to... right? So, okay. Hey, look, you want to take just a couple more? I mean, I know we're just a little bit over, but maybe we could grab a couple. So there's a question that keeps coming up over and over and over again, and almost to the point where now people are kind of joking about it comes in from Rob and Roll, okay? It says, what is the best way to age gold humbuckers? Oh. Take a piece of old rotten celluloid plastic that's gassing off and put them in a tin can for six months. Okay. I, I, that's not down my alley. Really? Okay. I'd ask Eric Coleman. Okay. All right. Cool. I mean, right. they, they put them in acid, acid fumes, and there's all kinds of ways, but I'm not good for that. Yeah, I know the folks that are relicking and aging stuff, is there's a, quite a... No, I've quit it relicking. I, I, I can make some things look old, and I have done some relic finishes in my life, but it's, it's, not, it's not my way. Not your thing, huh? Okay. I've seen some jobs. I love them. I love the looks of an old beat-up guitar. Okay. And I love the uh, the real ones the most. Yeah, but I've seen s some guys, man, that that do it so good. I don't care. Yeah, it makes me feel good. Yeah, Tom yeah. Murphy and others. Yeah, yeah, some of them turn out really great. Oh yeah. Okay, Dan, I think we got another one of these under our belt. What do you say? Is people still out there? Oh my gosh, yeah. There's I don't know four hundred and well, they're staying around four hundred thirty-one right at the moment. That's so, wonderful. I yeah, if, is, yeah. I'm, I don't. Do I, they I'm, have a way of saying hi? Yeah, that they've been saying hi the whole time. Their comments are just hey. rolling. It's just like I mean, it's like I can't even read the comment. It's just going by so fast. So, How many women are out there? I don't know. So, that's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, that's what you want to know. I've had a lot of. Uh, Supported a lot of women luthiers as many as I could. Yeah, and we'd like we'd like to see more. Okay, all right. So, thank you, uh, everyone who's tuned in. This thank has been you. wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Allie. Susan uh, and thanks, Rachel. Dan. And, thanks, and, Allie. Yeah, and we'll we'll do more of these in the future. So, if you didn't get your question answered today, Allie, send them in. We keep you a list. And just say hi. What's that? Couldn't Allie just come in and say hi? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's sitting right out there. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so if you didn't get your question answered today, go ahead and send it in. We keep a list, and then that'll kind of help us kind of get started on our next time that we do this. Yep, but thank you again, um, and we appreciate everything, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. <laughs> we off? Yeah. Bye. Bye, Dan. Bye, people. Bye, Dan. That's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm.